All right, welcome back to another Koenji Shan Reviews, the manga show. And this, my fine friends, is Kaze Shinobu, the greatest mangaka on the face of the planet. And I gotta be honest, making this video has made me a little bit crazy because I spent the last year and a half tracking down every Kaze Shinobu title I can get my hands on, this art book, stuff in old shoujo magazines and old anthologies. It's been a lot of work and trying to organize and put this all together into one video has proved to be a lot more than I anticipated. I was even digging up like articles, having people across Japan send me stuff that they could get their hands on that I couldn't get. Uh, it's been a journey people so I hope by the end of this video you also think that Kaze Shinobu is the greatest if not one of the greatest mangaka on the face of the planet. Um, what we'll do is we'll go through the manga I have collected chronologically but before we do that let's take a look at this. This is Shinobu Kaze the illustration. This is an art book that he put out in 2011. It came in a box set. It was Dynamic Box, the Dynamic Productions 30th Anniversary box set they put out with Devil Man in it, Kaze Shinobu, uh, Cutie Honey, some other stuff in there. So this is pretty hard to find on its own, although this copy I did find on its own. And I also have the box set. So I actually have two copies. So be on the lookout, people. One might be available one day in the future. Um, but let's take a look at this so we can get a good feel for his artwork. And then after we go through this, we'll get into his manga. It's still crisp and creaky. This is the Tobira E from Maya. Um, Tobira means door and A means picture. So the cover page, not the cover of the magazine that it came out in, but the cover of the page of the story. And then here, this is from the Tokyo International Film Festival. It must have been a poster or something. And uh, I don't think this was published. This is from 1995, but we can see his religious iconography, symmetry, and some ladies in here. Not just badass dudes, but also badass ladies in a lot of his stories. Now we're getting into his bread and butter. This is Violence and Peace, 1977. I think the Tonko Bone came out a little bit later. Uh, I have the Tonko Bone, so we'll take a look at that. And uh, one of the stories in the first story was published in Heavy Metal, which we'll get to here in a moment. But this is where we really start seeing the combination of religious iconography, cybernetics, futurism, um, and uh, of course we have this angel here, hardcore primary colors, so it really pops. I don't know how come <laughs> primary colors are hardcore, but you'll see as we go along, you'll see the themes. 1981, this means satsu or korosu, to kill. We'll get into his influences here in a bit as well. So here in Ryu, the strongest man on the face of the planet, he splits the earth in half. Here we have space, we have this girl, and then we have the earth in the background, and a steel heart split in half, which you can see th these kinds of themes and also this kind of uh, the duality. It works well with his symmetrical imagery. This is Ugetsu Monogatari. This was his foray into Jidai Geki or period pieces that he released in 96. I've tried to pick this up, but I haven't been able to find it at a reasonable price. It usually runs between $50, $70, something like that. Um, what can you do? And apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic world themes, you know, Armageddon. So we have the Mushroom cloud there from some sort of atomic blast. Lots of floating eyes. This is the second image of floating eyes. And these two page spreads are sick. This is 1997. And that dude looks like he's from 97, but nothing else in here does. So you can see the kind of Buddhist figures, Shiva's, Shiva type arms on that one. And the earth in the background. So where are we? What's going on here? Pyramids, wild stuff. 
more futurism. And in 1998, he put this out, uh, Denshi Rikoku, which is published by NHK. NHK is basically the Japanese uh, BBC, the national, you know, broadcaster. And uh, I think this was about kind of showcasing Japan's technologies or something. I actually won this in an auction once, and then the auction seller declined to sell it to me, and I do not know why. Said something about the condition, I'm not too sure, um, but it's a hard one to get your hands on. This is Horror House, so he's done a lot of shoujo horror stuff in the past, little one-shots for various magazines, which we'll take a look at some of that later. Um, the interview in here is pretty good. Most of his interviews, he says the same stuff. So we'll get into some of that. But one thing that it did pop out in here was, you know, he uh, got into manga because one of his friends moved. His friend had some Astro Boy and some Tetsujin 28 Go in his collection. So Kaze Shinobu got stoked by those and that really got him into the robots and stuff like that. And uh, when he was in high school in the art club, one of his friends was making uh, doujinshi or self-produced manga and knew Go Nagai. So they would go over to Go Nagai's house and show what they'd been working on. And by summer of his last year in high school, um, Go Nagai hired him during summer break to come work uh, as an assistant on Harenshi Gakuen and uh, Kikai-kun. So that was his early work as an assistant and then upon graduation from high school he joined Dynamic Productions, Dynamic Pro and uh, became an assistant for Go Nagai. And shortly, a little bit after that, um, yeah, a little bit after that, a while after that, I should say, then he started to publish his own stuff. And this is the awesomeness. This is Ryu, the strongest man on the face of the planet. We're going to do a full flip through of that here in this video. More Buddhist iconography. This is an illustration, from a cover illustration from a 1996 release of Ryu. Um, this one also was a cover illustration from the 77 um, second edition. So he changes up the cover for each edition. This is a pinup. This is Dokyo, his uh, master and rival. Here, look at those wings. Those wings are very devil man looking, huh? I mean, they're not his wings. These are actually some sort of like parts of the machine in the background. But don't those remind you of Devil Man's wings? And again, we're still in here trying to get an idea of some of Kaze Shinobu's art, right? I mean, the mask that Ryu wears is very much in line with the kind of faces and characters that Go Nagai did, so. So keep all these images in mind. So before we move on, let's see where are we at, page 28, interview part two. Before we move on, let's take a look at some of his influences. So I don't have any, everything, but some of his influences, so most mangaka here were, from this era were influenced by uh, Tezuka Osamu, or Mizuki Shigeru, or Umez, or various other uh, mangaka from the previous decades. And uh, Kaze Shinobu is a little bit different. He was influenced by people like Filipino Alex Nino, or uh, film director Suzuki Seijun, who did Tokyo Drifter, Tattooed Life, also, Ohara Kazuki, who was a director, um, influenced uh, the name Strongest Man on the Face of the Planet that he came up with. Uh, Alphonse Mucha was a big influence, but maybe his biggest influence, which is quite apparent when you look at his stuff, is Philippe Joulet. So, let's see what I can do as far as framing here. Sorry, me uno momento por favor. This La Nuit, The Night, 
is was a dedication to his wife that had passed away from, I believe, cancer. But I'm really, I don't know as much. But check out the symmetry of Jule. And keep in mind, and keep in mind Kaze. The paneling style. I bookmarked pages a long time ago prepping for this, and I don't know what I bookmarked. Because of the paneling, right? So you really can't talk about Kaze Shinobu without talking about Jule. Um, it seems that one of the, actually it doesn't seem I know one from an interview I read one of his assist one of the assistants at Dynamic Pro that worked alongside Kaze Shinobu had picked up a copy of of Jule in Ginza and brought it to the office. Of course, he couldn't read French, but he thought to himself, you know, I could do imagery like this though, and make into combine it with some of my other influences, like influences from movies, like influences from Bruce Lee. He was a huge Bruce Lee fan. Again, that symmetry, the paneling, very much in line with what Kaze does. Um, so he really did, and that was the, the book that they picked up was Lone Sloan. So he started modeling his style after Jule and Mucha. I think you're getting the idea here. Let's see if I bookmarked a couple cool ones in here as well. Who knows what I bookmarked or why? As you'll see later, he likes these swirling patterns of people being sucked into space or spirits leaving bodies or just all around chaos to add kind of some chaos to the, to the story. And another big influence on him was Yoko Tadanori, illustrator and artist. So we'll take a couple looks. A look at a couple pages here. Especially when you start looking at the coloring. You start to see some parallels between Kaze Shinobu and Yoko. I bookmark a couple things here. This book is rad. There's some cool stuff in here. And then you get into some of the, the Buddhist and other religious iconography. And again, note the colors, right? So, influenced by Yoko, Jule, Bruce Lee, Alex Nino, Suzuki Seijun. Rather than just how many mangaka were really just influenced by fellow mangaka that they worked under or that they were fans of. Let's get back to the art book. So keep all of that in mind while we go through this. This was in SF Adventure, 1980. He did a lot of illustrations for SF magazines, SF Magazine, SF Adventure, music magazines, Quick Japan. This is from a special collection, Nostradamus, no Daxo. 
A bit different from his typical stuff. This is from the same. And from the same, but then we see a little bit more of his typical style. Love his horror stuff, you know? The horror stuff is really cool because there's not a lot of it out there. But I got a couple things around here. Um, one thing to note is before he did Boy Who Has Government 45 in 1976, 77, before he, and one thing to point out is, you know, this that Ta Yoko, that book came out in 74. Um, Jule was coming out right around the same time, so that fits perfectly with the time frame of just before Boy Who Has Government 45 came out. I just heard a motorcycle go by. Did you hear that? But yeah, he did a bunch of one-shot stuff. All of these are first time ever published illustrations. Um, unknown, it says Hashitsu Fume. Unknown when they were first published. But, or, I don't know. And then in the back here we have Violence Becomes Tranquility. This is famous because this was released in, or released, this was uh, in Heavy Metal in 1981. So there's English available online and in, of course, that old Heavy Metal issue. This is the first story in Violence and Peace as well. But it's cool having it in this larger format. So I have Violence and Peace in the Tunkle Bone, but having these big Aeon pages, just so cool. Right, I'm gonna get more into this story when we go into the Tunkle Bone. And still sticking with religious imagery, space, psychedelic. It's just straight up psychedelic, you know? And this is Heart and Steel. This was released, uh, printed in Epic. And, God, what year was, was that? 1981. Marvel Magazine of Adult Fantasy. You can see right there. That heavy metal was 1980. So Heavy Metal 80, Epic 81. Trying to keep track of my dates here. Um, Heart and Steel. Um, human versus, not versus, but in contrast with the machine. Again, his symmetrical style works good with this kind of duality, story of duality. And again, as I said, he likes things flying in the air, whether it be man, machine, or spirit being sucked into the cosmos. There are rumors that uh, he would meditate in a teepee in his living room for days on end without talking to anyone. So ultra recluse. Whether that's true or not, I am not sure. But I've read enough kind of, I've read enough, I've read every interview out there that I could find. Whether in the back of books or in magazines or online. The robot wants to feel and dream like a human. Definitely some Philip K. Dick vibes going on in some of his stories and art as well, so I'm sure that he that had some influence on him as well. And the time period is fitting. And that, my fine friends, is Shinobu Kaze the illustration. 2000, not 2011. Sorry. Anyways, um, from Dynamic Box's 30th anniversary box set. All right, let's take a quick break and then let's get into all of his manga. 
Do you like rare, weird, and just wild manga that is not only hard to find on most SNS but will probably get you kicked off? Then head over to Patreon, Koenji Sean Reviews. This is where I post the craziest stuff from my collection of now over 1400 volumes of manga, retro magazines, and art books. For just $3 a month, you get all of that exclusive content, and I'm posting up there a couple times a week now. So head on over to Koenji Sean Reviews on Patreon. Now, let's get back to the show. So, Kaze Shinobu burst onto the scene in 1976 with his release of The Boy Who Has Government 45, Government O Mota Shonen. This was released in Manga Shonen, and then this is actually the 1997 re-release, including a bunch of other stories in it as well that appeared in either Manga Shonen or other magazines at the time. I'd have to refer to it to see. This is actually my favorite era of Kaze Shinobu, late 70s, so 76 to 1980. Um, just great stuff came out then, and we can see that his style is pretty much locked in by this point. Incidentally, Kaze Shinobu is not his real name, of course. His He was a big fan of ninja stuff, especially like Kamui Den and Sasuke, by uh, Shirato Sampe, and he liked the name uh, Fuma Ninja. Fuma means kind of a wind magic ninja, or the ninja of wind magic. And he and Go Nagai sat down together to come up with a pen name for him, and he shortened that to Kaze, the Fu in Fuma, and uh, Shinobu, the Nin in Ninja. So we can see here the English titles. There's nine stories in here. Um, incidentally, we're gonna look at violence and peace and a lot of these stories cross over. There's a couple of them that don't. And uh, here we are. Violence becomes trans tranquility. The opening in here was released in Heavy Metal in 1980. So much stuff to dig through. Here, let me go back. I, I hate, I just hate being wrong. There we are. Heavy Met, it's got the heavy metal reference there in 1980. And the butt, was that Heart and Steel? We have a couple. Anyways, let's go through it. Violence becomes tranquility. Like I mentioned before, lots of primary colors. I'm not gonna detail every bit of the story, but here he's off on a quest with his katana and his guitar. But this being, this angel, has a weapon that he needs because he cannot battle the world with the sword alone. His spirit separates from his body, very psychedelic. And again, check out the colors. Yoko comes to mind, his primary colors. Paneling, Jule. I do not speak French, I'm probably butchering his pronunciation. And as we saw before, the religious imagery and iconography. We have heart and steel here. Um, I don't know. People ask me which is if I if you're gonna buy Kaze Shinobu, what would I buy? What should I get? I strongly recommend this one because it's a little bit larger size than the Tonko Bone of Violence and Peace, and it's got most of the. I think there's one story in Violence and Peace that is not in here, but the rest of them cross over. And this has more stories in Violence and Peace. Um, but Ryu, the strongest man on the face of the planet, is my favorite and most people's favorite. And it's the one that he is always asked about, so it's definitely his most popular. Mind blown, man. I feel like I'm tripping. Tripping on Kaze. And then we get a 
page like this, with a really soft touch, which doesn't look like Kamimura, but still somewhat reminds me of Kamimura. Maybe the coloring. Kamimura like to use like really strong primary colors as well. Now the rest of this is black and white. Um, Kacho Fugetsu. There's been a world war. He must battle everyone left on the planet and she is left. See again, getting back to mushroom clouds and post-apocalyptic scenarios and since he must kill her, religious iconography. It's just dope. And then you think like maybe she's gonna talk her way out of it. Fuck no, he burns her to death. But he is a robot, and now he is, or maybe he is a cyborg is a better, better term. But now he is alone. Because he has killed the last person. There's those damn eyes again. Love them. And she reappears. I've read and reread and reread all of this stuff because I kept on meaning to come back to making this video, but it is a bit overwhelming because there's just so much to cover when you're talking about Kaze Shinobu. And this is someone who disappeared from the scene for for years on end at, on multiple occasions. Again, rumors that he was a recluse. It was all a dream. But there she is, but now she disappears into the sky, or was it? Can't fly to space. So he has some school themes too, and that, like I said, he was in some shoujo manga as well, you know, directed towards young ladies. So this is a high school story. The boy who is tormented jumps out the window, yet lives. He has some powers. When the bullies come, he tears them apart. Because he is no normal boy. So psychedelic. It makes me want to take some mushrooms, man. Don't worry, I'm not taking any mushrooms. Or do worry that I'm not taking any mushrooms. Alright, let's move ahead. Reincarnation for Love, this is a story of two twins that die, come back, die, come back through each other's bodies and are reincarnated, and the man that loves them both, or a lot, especially loves one of them, and cannot, and is stuck in the cycle of death and rebirth. But the death and rebirth part's pretty sick. Let's take a look at that. So he's, and also she's prego because they're trying to have a baby, but before they can have a baby, she gives birth to something else. Paneling, Jule, and out comes her sister, her twin sister. So, supernatural, a bit horror, less sci-fi in this one, but definitely has some sci-fi elements. And then we get into the Annihilator, about the man with the gun, 
and the perfect shot. They have reconstructed his body. Blam! Little English in there. Strongest assassin on the face of the planet. I'm kind of spending a lot on this one. Looking a little Bruce Lee-ish, but with a gun. I mean, this stuff fits right in with any, in any heavy metal issue ever. Again, I probably don't need to go into all the details, but here is the classic, The Boy Who Has Government 45. It's a school story. There's a boy um, into, into model guns. And incidentally, Kaze Shinobu is a huge model gun collector. I think in his most recent interview in 2008, 2021 he mentioned he still has about 15 of them and he's constantly sells and upgrades and trades out and uh, in this story this boy spent some time overseas and had a chance to shoot a government 45 a real one but this kid's a, a, a hypochondriac and a kind of a shut-in and kind of a nerd not liked by anyone but look at this it's raining people something's going on in the school making teachers commit suicide but he knows how to shoot a gun and the paneling again man and these psychics students that have a psychic group implore him to use this real government 45 that they give him to kill their adversaries that are killing people in the school, killing the teachers of the school. Look at mass suicide by mind control. This is a wild day. <laughs> First one teacher, then a whole teacher's room of teachers committing suicide. Now it's all on the boy. And we're going to fast forward a little bit here. This is the psychic group having mostly been decimated. Decimate? Well, there's not enough of them to be decimated. Let's see. Five of six of them were murdered. And now it's the boys' turn to kill the adversaries. The nerdwells. really simple just heavy black the gun and I'm not gonna tell you the twist at the end there but the girl running away is it the girl ectoplasm I believe this is the last or the second to last see we have he puts badass girls in his stories not just badass dudes so There's a boy trapped in an old man's body because his mother, who is this mystic, had reincarnated him when he died at, as a child or something, if I recall correctly. And now he wants a new body because at school everyone teases him because he looks like an old man. This girl takes to helping him. So we do have a badass, badass lady in here. Uh, Super Time Woman. We're going to see this in another book, too, but this is where time slows down and a woman and her baby must escape. We have some interviews in the back, which I always dig. I've made photocopies of all of these. People have sent me some. Um, yeah, yeah, cool stuff. And just as I said, there is the man himself with a model gun. And that is the boy who has government 45. Let's move on. Moving on, we have Ryu, the strongest man on the face of the planet. This came out in 1977. 
And this is the re-release from 1996. It was serialized, I believe, in, I want to say, 19 issues. And we'll get into that because we got some details inside of here. And this came out last year in September of 2021. It's the exact same story, a bit larger format, a bit expensive. This runs around $75. So I picked it up because it's got some stuff in the back that's kind of really important to the background of Ryu and Kaze Shinobu. It has the most recent interview in with him. And it also has some of the raws from his first 100 and I believe 60 page prototype and uh, some things to mention in the prototype so Dokyo his rival in the story which we'll get into he and Dokyo had a homosexual affair with each other as we can see from this panel I was gonna scan these to put these up but I really don't want to break down this book at all When he brought the prototype to the editor at Dynamic Pro, they wanted him to remove the gags from it. There's just, you know, he originally was a gag mangaka, so he has a lot of kind of funny stuff in Ryu as well. I mean, Jesus Christ, Miyamoto Musashi, and Bruce Lee all make appearances, so just that in itself is a little bit of a gag, but they wanted him to keep it more serious. Sorry, it wasn't the editor at Dynamic Pro, it was the editor at the magazine that they released in, and Dynamic Pro also. These prototypes, I'm showing you the prototypes first so you can get an idea of what the base was before he did the actual serialized manga and this is the final page Owari and we have the earth being split in half so he's stuck with that and that is page 130 not 160 and just to go back these here are all of the original cover pages Here, here. Some of the alternative covers. Sorry, these aren't cover pages. So this goes into extreme detail on the differences between what was released in the magazine and what was released in the Tonkobone and later Tonkobones. And mostly it was stuff like they replaced katakana with kanji or there's a number of things they did. And these are all of the illustrations there we have the spiraling people Kanren Irasto or related illustrations there we have devil man of course he still worked I mean worked for years and years at dynamic pro so he did a lot of work on Gonagai stuff and these are all of the, the cover pages, Tobira E, from the magazines. So there's the first one, 1977. I believe there are 19 of these. We shall see. So the covers for each chapter. I like that. The Jesus shows up in chapter 14. And there, Miyamoto Musashi, Bruce Lee, and Jesus come to battle. Ryu. He actually didn't know how to end this. And then the magazine editors are like, okay, time to wrap this thing up. It was Shukan 
Shonen Magazine. This is an advert that they put out. And a bunch of other ads and stuff. Probably in, you know, other issues. Advertising for the upcoming issue. Or past issues. And this was released by Dynamic Pro. But the beginning we have some red and black. Like this. And then as we move on into the book, it's black and white. The eyes, the eyes. All right. And here we have the Tonkobon 1996 release, which I strongly recommend this one to pick up because it's got this beautiful color at the beginning. Still in with that religious iconography. So there's other people out there that have put out videos covering Ryu, the strongest man on the face of the planet. I think Kayfabe even did one. Um, so if you want to get into all the weeds, go check out one of those or just search around. But no one, as far as I know, has put out anything like I'm doing right now, covering as many of his works through the years as possible. So everyone's hunting. Everyone wants to kill Ryu because Ryu is the strongest man on the face of the planet. Dokyo here is his master. Once he puts on the mask, he will not be able to take it off. That mask is kind of holding back his powers. This is his little sister. His father was a scientist and an inventor who has died. His sister's teased often. Here she's bringing home extra food from lunch, which you're not supposed to do, to give to her brother who's hiding in the basement. They live with her aunt and uncle. They don't know that Ryu's there, but and they make her work as kind of a slave in the house, cleaning them up after them. But he had disappeared for five years to train under Dokyo comes back to a karate tournament and he is too damn strong for everyone bam illegal kick so he's disqualified you're not supposed to do full contact kicks to the head in karate that was against Kayama and this is Kayama's girlfriend, who will be back in the story to seek revenge. And Very Fist of the North Star-esque, which came out later, of course. His brain and head explodes after, and legs break and everything is so sick, after Ryu has left the stadium. Now he's just exploding. And the fiance is devastated. He was remembering. This is why he's in the basement of the aunt and uncle's house. But of course, Dokyo and her have to come get revenge and stop Ryu because Ryu, as we find out later, has been reincarnated numerous times. He even killed the Jesus. Yes and he will destroy the world if not stopped. This machine is supposed to limit his powers, but after Dokyo shows up to kill him, so much awesomeness, just awesomeness, blasting through walls, shows up to kill him and then it's the next page here. She's trying to use the machine to stop them. The little sister. And there we still have classic Jule slash Kaze paneling. Symmetry. He's doing a Buddhist mantra here. He's got the power of the Buddha. The sister is going to try to stop them, but she is not, the machine is not strong enough to hold back their power, and she 
is kicked up into the sky and fucking murdered. Look at that. Look at her eyeballs shoot out. When I read this for the first time, I'm like, oh shit! He just killed his little sister! Not good, man! Not good! As we will see. Now he's super bummed. An Arashi of Storm comes in. And now Ryu must harness his powers even while wearing the mask to enact his revenge and defeat Dokyo and the fiance, whose name is escaping me off the top of my head. He's kind of getting his ass kicked here a little bit because he's trying to figure out how to harness his powers. But in true Ryu fashion, makes a comeback and my favorite scene is right here in the battle he's getting chopped up by head saw here but here let's that's sick it's a sick image but he is not having that Remembering the death of Kayama. Yeah, here. He breaks off the saw with a swift chop. Um, so you gotta remember, in 1973, we have the occult boom. So he uses a lot of like UFOs and cult type themes in his stories. Um, there was a lot of like cults in America and in Japan at that during that period of time. And he combines it with the religious iconography and the karate boom that was spurred by uh, Enter the Dragon. He says he went to um, a midnight showing in Ginza of Enter the Dragon, immediately bought plastic nunchukas afterwards, and decided he was going to do something with Bruce Lee and incorporate it into a manga at some point. But here, he grabs her by the ankle and swings her around and blasts Doku in the head with her head. And starts using her as a weapon. He does this a lot where he has a repeating image. Although slightly different. It's not like a copied image. It's all hand drawn. But he does this a lot to show motion. Twists, twists her up. God, why can't I remember her name off the top of my head? And then now he's messing up Dokyo. Who must summon the power of Buddha maintain his power just to stay alive at this point. Anyways, here, let's move ahead to the hands. Oh wait, no, hands are right here, right? Tears off his hands. Dokyo's hands. And he's really messing him up. And then punches him with his own hand before it even falls to the ground. So sick. All right, we're gonna move forward a little bit here. Then the hands start trying to strangle him, but of course, Ryu is the strongest man on the face of the planet and he will not be killed by a couple floating hands. Jule does this too, where you'll be reading and then you have to turn the book sideways to get the full two-page spread. All right, this is taking gonna take forever if we just keep on doing this page by page, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Dokyo goes back to re regroup, 
rebuild his body. Of course, the little sister is still dead. There's some religious stuff going on. We have all of the common, all of the Buddhist statues. I think all of them on earth flying into the sky. Again, so he likes this kind of imagery of the souls of people or statues or robotics machines doing this kind of thing and Dokyo uses his powers his Buddhist powers in that alien machine so that alien machine we don't really know what it is but some sort of kind of UFO thing to harness the powers of the universe so that he can battle Ryu by resurrecting the Jesus. So Jesus has come back to earth to battle and kill Ryu who actually killed him in a war during the time where I guess Christ was crucified and also Bruce Lee and Miyamoto Musashi so a little bit of gags going on here we have the UFO just a little bit of everything man a little bit of everything and uh, a car wreck? I've talked a lot about this in previous mangas, about car wrecks in horror manga, especially in the 70s. Because I think the peak of car accident deaths was 1970, 1971, around there. I mean, the safety of cars was awful, but there's tons of them on the road. So it was a big part, a big theme in horror manga, and SF manga, sci-fi manga at that time. Um, we have the end of the world coming, so apocalypse. And then he's in the hospital and we have Jesus, Miyamoto, and Bruce Lee show up to kill him. But again, we're talking about the strongest man on the face of the planet, damn it. They're trying to take him out, but Ryu will not be vanquished basically disintegrates them with two kicks. And let's move ahead, battling the Jesus. So Jesus can't believe that Ryu is so strong, even while wearing the mask. Humans are not supposed to move like this. But then the Jesus reveals his true self, splits open, and this demon lady comes out and there we have more of that kind of people formed people or spirits formed in this chain going from earth and he really loves it and tell me that looks like devil man lady kind of it kind of looks like um, you know the bird chick from devil man the bird claw feet and the wings. I mean, he worked a lot on that, on that stuff. I'd have to check all the, the dates though to see what came out later and what came out before. And by the time we get to the end, it's just, it's just mayhem. It really is just a uh, psychedelic mayhem. Finally, he is shot up into space and he is able to remove the mask. The mask falls to the ground. As does he. He punches through the alien machine. And not just the alien machine, but earth itself <laughs> and 
And that, my fine friends, is Ryu, the strongest man on the face of the planet, the abridged version by Sean. I wasn't going to spend this much time on this. We won't spend as much time on his one shots when I get to those. But, uh, got a lot more coming. So hang on tight. Alright, next we have Violence and Peace. This was released in 1980. Like I mentioned before, most of these stories are in Boy Who Has Government 45. There's one story that isn't, but the cover is sick. Still have to show it to you a little bit. And we have color at the beginning. Again, Violence Becomes Tranquility, one of his most famous stories. These are all color here, but this is a slightly smaller Tonko Bone format than Boy Who Has Government 45 or the, what did I say, 97, 96. Color is great. Um, listen to the voice of your inmost heart. This is uh, not in the other anthology, the other collection. That planet. The boy dematerializes in front of his mother. So moving forward here, I'm not going to go into all the detail on all of the stories that we look at, you know, from here on, because it would just, we'd be here for another two hours, man. Although I could talk about Kaze Shinobu for another two hours. Again, more apocalyptic themes. More cyborgs. More guns, guns, guns. Man, he loves his guns. More mass murder. And there we have it. The Earth, all the souls leaving Earth. This, you know, bordering on, I mean, science fiction, you know, Gekiga, you know, action, horror. He gets a little bit of everything in there. Occult. Throw a UFO in the corner just for the fuck of it. And why not a space guitar, man? We already went this far. Might as well do it. Hikariga! The light. Alright, so I've tracked down all kinds of one-shots he's put out. One of my favorites is this. This is Pucci Flower, Petite Flower, from 19... May 1982, as you can see here. And this is Shoujo Manga. I bought 10 volumes of this from 1981 and 82 just so that I could get one story by Kaze Shinobu. Midori no Obasan ga kawaii, or Midori's aunt is scary. And you can see most of this stuff is romance. School kid stuff, you know, shoujo manga. Um, love stories, European love stories. Or Japanese love stories. But, when we get back here, we have a horror story. Midori no Oba-san ga kawaii. And this is a ghost story. So, basically we follow this girl. Who? Walks to school every morning. But is an outcast, ignored by her friends. She recalls her summer vacation with her friends in the past. But every time she gets to the crossing, she cannot cross the road. And this is... The crossing guard is Midori's aunt, who is scary, per the title. So she goes home every day just to be ignored by her family. 
you can see where this is going. Eyes. There's Midori's aunt. Eyes. Ai. And her crossing Midori over to the other side because Midori had been killed in a car accident. Great story. Classic shoujo horror. And Midori's aunt was an angel getting her to cross over to the other side. Um, and look at that. The earth split in half. And he's writing these themes, dude. I don't even know why that has to be there. What's that have to do with this story? Well, he wants to tie it into some of his other stories and pe keep people interested in his works. Um, moving on to 1984, we have the Medium series. I believe there's something like 14 volumes of these, but I think 1, 2, and 3 have Kaze Shinobu in them. So let's take a look here at this one. And these are basically horror writers. We have Takahashi, Yosuke, Kaze Shinobu. Kaze, of course, uh, Takahashi is horror. Ida, also horror. This is In the Quietness. This is a one shot. The woman left, the man disappeared. He does not know where she went. But again, in 1984, he's still doing the same kind of paneling, the same kind of imagery. lot of the same I mean the style he never breaks away from his stuff I mean even in the last one we saw Midori he still has to throw in a little bit of this style you know this fantastical style even though that was just like a standard shoujo horror story yet another car accident Representative of, I don't know, technology. Technology becoming stronger than humans. Very psychedelic. Um, and then medium two here. Shinobu, Sen no Knife, uh, Takahashi, I mean Ida, still um, the Gedatsu. So we saw some of the Gedatsu in the illustration book at the very beginning. So a lot of his stuff that he put out before, so you know, we went over this before. Um, gets re-released in anthologies later in the future. Um, in the early 90s, there's a big resurgence of like occult and sci-fi and horror manga. So he makes a resurgence then. He pops up in a lot of anthologies. But not always. So we get into like this. It's 1993. Tiger Mask the Star. So you're thinking to yourself, what? Tiger Mask the Star? I know Tiger Mask. I don't know Tiger Mask the Star. This is Tiger Mask. So there's a few authors that worked on Tiger Mask. Ohara and, uh, God, what is the main guy's name who invented Tiger Mask? Um, God. I want to say that I have a note around here somewhere. 
I do know I have a note around here somewhere, but there's actually a lawsuit over this. And I think that's why Tiger Mask the Star only went two volumes, and volume two is nearly impossible to find. I found them bundled together for around $100. I picked up volume one pretty reasonably, I think like $25 or something like that, but I can't find volume two on its own anywhere. But you can see, I, I've marked some pages. We have the original Tiger Mask. Bruce Lee makes an appearance. Remember, this is original Tiger Mask. Not Kaze Shinobu. And then we get into Kaze Shinobu's Tiger Mask. And we have a Japanese underground wrestler in New York. Um, this is the crime boss in the S&M. Um, Tiger Mask the Star is homeless, but he's the strongest. He's the strongest wrestler from underground wrestling, and he makes his way to New York to fight at Madison Gar Madison Square Garden. But we can see still sticking to his classic paneling styles. The fight scenes are really fun in this. I can't wait to track down volume two because I want to see how it ends, man. And I have a feeling it's going to end very abruptly because of the head crushery. Because he was threatened with a lawsuit or settled out of court. I don't really know. There's not a lot of details out there. I searched for what I could in Japanese but really couldn't find a lot. Dudes, <laughs> check out these dudes. Jump roping in armor. Him bending a coin with his, a quarter with his fingers. And although Tiger Mask the Star is a badass, so here he is without his mask on, so we do know who he is. He's this long-haired, ripped, homeless dude that does massively hardcore training. Pulling a motorcycle with his neck while the motorcycle tries to ride off in the opposite direction. And again, more classic Kaze Shinobu paneling. Um, God, I wish I had volume two, but I do not. There was one more thing I wanted to show you in here. So yeah, the, the mafia boss is into S&M. There he is wearing a brassiere, getting carried by a bunch of naked ladies. And here we have another reason why it probably got in some trouble. Um, Hulk Hogan makes an appearance. Drinking with dudes at the bar, and then Tiger Mask and him go out to a park to fight each other a little bit, which is pretty fun. But in the end, after their little tussle, Hulk Hogan sees some kids walking by so they're pretty much back and forth in this battle. God, I really wanted to see how this turns out. So you see some Boy Scout troop walking by and he's like, ah, gotta go sign some autographs for my fans and he just kind of takes off. He's like, we'll do this another day. So that's Tiger Mask the Star. Um, Holy 2, if you can get your hands on this little bunko, I don't usually buy them, but this is great. This says Inuki Kaneko, Ochazuke Nori, Kaze Shinobu, Tanima Yumeji, and Hino Hideshi in it. Really cheap and affordable, you can find it out there. Let me find out which page we have. And it's there's three Kaze Shinobu stories in here. This one is about, this is Shuryo no Namida. The Tears of the Dead Spirit. Ooh, eyes. This girl starts puking up bodies. It's wild. Now we're gonna start seeing a little bit more gaggery going on. Gaggery. More gags going on. So this is very kind of spooky at first. Why is she puking up spirits? And then what's going on? Gets a little bit psychedelic. I. Airplanes and machines always make 
way into his stories, to these one shots. At the end, she's just kind of got a piece of human hanging out of her mouth. And she's like, before she's like, I want to die, so this stops. And she's like, I don't want to die. Shinpi Kagami? So the mirror. I don't know, the mirror, like, of the gods, kind of soul type thing. I don't know. I don't know. Didn't really think about it. Death. Remember before it was Satsu. Kill. Here is death. Eyes. These one shots are fun though. This mirror that you can kind of see into another. Is it a parallel universe? Is it the spirit realm? Satsijin ki ni wa shio. There's some time slipping going on in here, so now he's getting back to horror roots. Horror roots? Back to horror. I can't really say roots, because we know what his roots are. Gag manga. Check that out. The assailant. And there goes his hand. Man. And angel eyes here. This, I think, we see in another one that I have. The police can't get in the building. This student that used to be teased has come back, come back from the dead to rip off everyone's faces, one by one, all of his tormentors. But she, Angel Eyes, has power to stop him. Check this out. She stabs him in the eyes with pencils, and then as she draws closer eyes he stabs her in the eyes with the pencils in his eyes fucking wild all right let's keep going i got a few more things here so just some one shots but before the one shots in 1996 kaze shinobu did zeus a story based on Greek mythology, which has some Roman mythology mixed in there. I'm bad at Western Civ. I dropped Western Civ for Asian Studies, man, so. But we do have some notes in the back. We have this good background that he wrote about uh, Greek mythology, some references that he refers to. And then the we have Apollo, Uranus, Gaia, kind of the family tree of the gods here. So that kind of helps to read before getting into it. And then we have not much color here. Zeus. And per Kaze Shinobu, he has to put a twist on it. In the beginning, it's the end of the world, the apocalypse. People are doing drugs. Is that Snake from Escape from New York? Is that the professional? Luc Besson? From Jean Renault's. Jean Renault? God, it's easy to confuse dudes. And there we have more of that, uh, the kind of circular swirling around of chaos, which is the end of the world. In true Kaze Shinobu fashion and out of the rubble comes Gaia and her two children Gaia mother earth to restart civilization I just want to show a little bit they they do find refuge in this mysterious palace which has this beautiful garden kind of 
you know, the, the place where life will be sprung from again. The rebirth of the earth. But in, you know, like in the stories, man, I'm so bad at Greek history. Even though I read this, reread this again a couple days ago, no, a week ago, it's still eyes. It's still uh, hard for me to keep track of who's who, but these are the giants. I forget Kronos or I forget their names come to help out, take care of the kids. But we also have. There's some wild stuff going on in here. We have... Oh, that looks so cool. What is going on? She has a couple sons. She gets hurt one day. Of course, one of the sons sleeps with her because there's lots of incest in um, Greek mythology. You know, the... At one point, they have all these kids. And a prophecy says that the father, who was it, will be, uh, will lose his power to lose his reign to one of the children. So he must do what he must do, throw a couple in a hole and kill him. Another guy is pissed. Yeah, so we have some great... It, it seems like this was kind of cut short at the end. I think this was supposed to be an ongoing series that he was going to continue. But... I, once again, Kaze Shinobu's run does not last. I think he's just too esoteric for a lot of the publishers and just cannot seem to get a foothold. And after one Tonkobon, and I don't know how many chapters were released in magazines, it is dropped. It seems like it's supposed to continue, but it does not. You know, let's just keep going. I only got a couple things left here. So he did a bunch of one shots in Quick Japan from 15, 16, 17, maybe 19 and 20. There was a break in there. Um, here he kind of, these are really short, so we'll just flip through a couple. This is the Sovereign. This guy is looking at the stars. The stars tell him that he is going to be ruler of the earth. The next day he's walking through town and he realizes, nobody else realizes he's the, will, the ruler of the earth. And he's just a lowly kid again. And then all the people in the streets start turning into gears, except for him, to form this giant alien type machine. And then, little joke at the end, he's like, my coal is warm. So getting back into the gag stuff, 1997. This is also 1997. More Quick Japan is kind of a music magazine that has manga in it sometimes too. The Penitent, this is a two part series. Kind of, a, it looks like a hard boiled mystery, but there's some psychedelic kind of stuff going on in here as well. Supernatural, I should say. Supernatural as in a house full of shit. That's shit on the floor. That's where she lives. She's stuck living in a sewage shed. Her father is dead. And as we continue into the next continuation of the story, it takes place in the shit shed. So, still keeping his same style going, but now he's devolved into weird gags. Flashbacks to the father, who turned into a fly. Something about the, the ship shack they live in. She wants to be saved from the shit. He's so desperate to save her that he's willing to bathe in the shit. And rub his face in it and gargle. Ugh, it's disgusting. The hitman that's following them, he can't stand that shit. That shit show. That shit shack. Ugh. Um, 1998, he's still releasing one-shots in Quick. 
This one is also a gag manga, Kitchen Knife Master G. So this guy is one of those dudes that hangs out at the at the um, supermarkets trying to sell stuff, and he's a knife dude. But no one wants to buy his knives, but everyone wants to buy his competitor's knives. So he goes back home to construct the best knife ever. So the competitor's knife's got holes in it, so it's lighter, see? And more efficient, and stuff scrapes off of it better. He's like, I'm gonna make a knife so badass, it is invisible. Everyone's gonna love my knife. But it works so well that vegetables fly everywhere all over the people in the audience, and they just get pissed at him. More gags, man. Check this out. I just found this the other day. Yeah. Miyaya Kazuhiko. I've been starting to collect from this year. Rad stuff. Uh, he does uh, Flesh Bomb Era. Nikudan Jidai. And of course, 1999 to 2000, we have Neo Devil Man, Neo Devil Man in Japanese, released by Dynamic pro i'm sure oh this is a kodansha um and this is a bunch of retelling of devil man related stories this is a three volume set i have all three volumes this is number three and we have mk23 no ona or the girl of mk23 she's a hit woman that kills demons so it's not really directly related to Devil Man, but it's a supernatural story about demons. So it fits into the Devil Man universe. The monsters are sick. All those years of working with Go Nagai. Culminating in a combination of Kaze Shinobu style with Go Nagai monsters. Demons. She was held captive by a demon and learned the ways of the demons. And now she is one of the most powerful demon hunters. And again, it's raining people. This time it is raining ladies. And we can see some of the other, there's other, a bunch of other artists in this three volume series doing Devil Man related stories. And these are the last two we have people and we're almost done. So we have, uh, what, what, what's, what, what are my notes here? 2014, 2019, 2015, 2017. Um, so this is uh, Inagawa Junji. He actually did something a couple years ago at the beginning of the COVID crisis with Ito Junji, Junji Ito, and they did a tie-up. I went over to the event over at Nakano Broadway. Um, this is a short one-off that Kaze's gotten here. These are all narrated, kind of uh, Twilight Zone style by Inagawa Junji. And this story is a story about a boy that can, whenever someone loses something, he can find it, make it reappear. At school, if somebody loses a pencil or a ruler or something, he will just make it reappear. And Inagawa Junji specializes in telling stories, like physically telling stories of true horror and mystery and supernatural stories. So they're all supposed to be based on true events according to stories that he's heard or that he's experienced himself then there's a typhoon and the boy's house is washed away but the boy's house reappears in a different part of town in Megiroku when before it was located somewhere else so clearly the boy he was in Shibuyaku before and then now in Megiroku um, the boy must have made the house reappear. And then finally, finally, this one shot is about a haunted studio 
They, the camera people saw something at a studio. They call Inagawa Junji to come investigate. He looks, he comes in to investigate. That's the apparition that was seen at the studio. They caught it on film, so he comes in to check the film. So this is kind of another classic horror story. We see these kind of zombie-esque monster faces. Pretty sick. And that is rad right there. And Inagawa Junji says at the end that yes, you did capture an actual spirit on tape, on video. Whew! And that, my fine friends, is Kaze Shinobu. Well, at least everything that I could track down for you guys on Kaze Shinobu. Um, there's plenty of other stuff out there. I'm telling you, he's making a resurgence recently because I follow a lot of places online and more and more people are getting interested in him. So if you want to get yourself some Kaze Shinobu, you better start hunting now while you still have a chance. And with that, let's move on. Well, we are here in Shibuya at Shibuya Crossing for the Eiguchi Hisashi Art Exhibition. Check out that huge Spy Family billboard they're all over the place down here they're even doing announcements over the loudspeakers for spy family because the anime i believe was coming out the next day um this is shibuya crossing and we're gonna walk up here to bunkamura for the hisashi eguchi art exhibition of course uh, eguchi is most famous probably for well first of all stop hibari-kun which ran from 1981 to 1983 it's a gag manga about a boy that stays in a house which is a Yakuza family, and the father has five daughters, one of them being Hibari-kun, who is actually a boy. So it was early gender bender manga, which really paved the way for a lot of other things to be developed around kind of similar themes, um, but this was back in 1981, gotta remember, during that time. Uh, his artwork really encapsulates uh, 1980s pop. This event is called Record because he did numerous um, record covers over the years, CD jackets and such for different bands, and uh, he has a book out by the same name called Record. I forget when it was released, 2017, 18, around there, but the exhibition is pretty rad. Um, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be filming in here. I get told off at the very end, but, eh, well, I did, and so here you go. It's cool, he's got a lot of raws up, some just like pen and ink stuff. And then color stuff, so you can kind of see his process, how he goes through things. Um, the little one, she really enjoyed that, seeing how things went from pencil to ink, yep, as we can see here, to color. And it's a great learning experience for a young artist. Me, myself, I went for an Associate of Fine Arts in the beginning of my college career until I was told by my father that he would not pay for a college degree in art, so I switched to East Asian Studies, which is probably a better choice because it ended me up here for the past 19 years. Dazed and confused, man. So, of course, since this is for the record exhibition, there's a lot of music themes going on. And we even have this, this uh, dope guitar over here. Great exhibition. Here, I'm going to show you a little bit of what I picked up while I was at the exhibition. So, I did buy some stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was great to go down there and check out some of Eguchi Hisashi's works. I'll explain a little bit more later, but I had planned to meet the master himself, but was unable to. But at the end of every nice day with the little one, gotta go out for some good food. Hamburger steak. All right, let's take a look at what I picked up while I was at the show. Very
All right, so this is what I got while I was at the Eguchi Hisashi exhibition. I didn't pick up any books because all the books that were there I could pick up and I thought I might get one if I went back for the signing later on. So if you spent more than 3,500 yen, you got a ticket to come back between, I think it was 6.30 at night and 8.30 at night to get an autograph and and uh, Eguchi would have signed one of the things that you had purchased. Not everything, but one of the things. But I was down there in the afternoon. It's spring break, and I just didn't have time to get back down there. But I did pick up a few little things that I wanted. I got some postcards, some cool Eguchi postcards. Pretty awesome. Nice. I wanted to get a lot of the rock and roll ones because it is record, the name of the event. And then one of the larger cards just to kind of display on my shelf. That's pretty cool. Same logo on the back. Got a clear file to put everything in. And there's actually two clear files in here. You get a small one. And then the larger A4 size. And then finally I picked up this. I have a Junji Ito mug on my shelf, which is pretty awesome. And it's great for displaying stuff and putting stuff in. You know, it's... I really don't buy toys and that much display stuff for my shelves, mostly just manga, but if it's something by an artist I really like, such as Eguchi Hisashi, then I pick it up. Probably won't put any coffee in here, probably will just put it on my shelf to display it. Who knows, maybe one day I'll sell it. Who knows. But at any rate, thanks to everyone who subs, likes, and shares. You are all awesome. If you have anything to add about Kaze Shinobu, or if you have anything to add about Eguchi, then let me know in the comments below. Any comment is a good comment. It helps to boost up the algorithm and get more people to come over and check out some of the weird manga that I am into. And of course, click that sub button if you want to help support the show in the easiest way possible and of course as i mentioned before i have a patreon page koenji sean reviews hop on over there if you want to see one to two videos a week of the really weird and wild stuff from my collection of i don't know now i'm up to around 1500 1600 or more uh retro manga weird manga and retro magazines art books i'm kind of lumping it all together nowadays so hop on over there to check out more and until next time everyone matane